Thank you everyone for joining. Um, we are very excited to, um, to have you here in the latest installment of our webinar series, Tech in Unexpected Places. This one focused on the telecommunications industry, 100 feet in the air. So um, we wanna thank our panelists for joining us today. Um, we are very excited to hear about our experts. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, number one, we are gonna be recording the session. So if anyone out there would like a copy of today's webinar, you know, send us a note, info at tactile.com. We'll show you that email address in a bit. We'll make sure you get a copy. Um, number two, as you are listening to our experts, at least in the beginning portion of our webinar, if you have some questions that you wanna ask, please put them in the Q&A box. At the end of uh, the latter part of the webinar, we'll go through a whole Q&A segment and we'll get through as many as those, of those questions as we can. So Q&A box, put them in there, we'll add them to the list. And finally, if anybody out there is having some technical difficulties, please put a note in the chat. We will do all we can to um, help get you uh, get you those technical issues figured out. So with that, again, I want to thank our three panelists for being here. We're joined today by Brian Orlandi of um, Timberline Communications. And we have Joe Klucke of Tactile and Fred Arnold of My Learning Alliance. So I would like to have each of the gentlemen take a couple minutes to talk about what they do at the company and a little bit of background on, on their organizations. And we'll dive into some specific telecommunications issues. So Brian, if you don't mind, uh, kick us off, please. Sure. I uh, just want to thank you, Ray, and, and the, the team for uh, inviting me to, uh, to speak and talk a little bit about uh, our experience with, um, with the product. Um, my name is Brian Orlandi. I'm the Vice President and General Manager for Timberline Communications, Inc., TCI. Um, we're a wireless services company in, based out of New England. Um, we service the Northeast. We do everything from new site builds and tower construction um, to carrier ads and modifications um, for various um, wireless, tier one wireless carriers and their vendors. Um, we also do um, inside plant and outside plants. We do uh, distributed antenna systems, both indoor and outdoor, private LTE networks. Um, and we have an electrical staff, electrical team, civil and um, uh, technical staff that deal with um, EV charging and power systems. Um, so everything from backup power to, um, to solar type installs, but kind of smaller ones. Um, and then we also do um, maintenance and emergency response for our carrier partners as well. So everything from, you know, disaster recovery and uh, troubleshooting on new site builds um, and really anything and everything from the, you know, gate at the front where the, where the, uh, the tower is accessed and everything in between to you get to the, uh, to the light, light fixture at the top if it's over 200 feet. One needs to be lit. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for that overview. Um, Joe, why don't you go next? Tell us a little, a little bit about a little bit about you and Tactile and the, the Manifest platform. Absolutely. And thanks, thanks Ray, and thanks uh, Fred and Brian for joining. You know, my name is Joe Kalupi. I work at Tactile and the VP of Sales and Strategic Partnerships. And Tactile is a company that, uh, that creates digital instructions, and those digital instructions can be overlaid into the real world using augmented reality. And, you know, we don't have, you know, all the exciting things, you know, necessarily that Brian has over there, you know, all the different divisions, you know, we're very focused on what we do and specifically, you know, our software and the platform and what we're doing to enable, you know, frontline workers and people who don't work at a desk, someone who works at their hands. You know, there's a lot of tools out there for people who sit at their desktop, but having tools available for people who are out in the field working with their hands in a, you know, hands-free type environment, you know, that's our, that's where we're laser focused right now. And, and that's what we do. And we're glad to be here to, to speak today. All right, thank you for that. And then Fred. Please tell us a little, a little bit about a little bit about yourself, a little bit about uh, Learning Alliance. Absolutely. So um, my name is Fred. I'm the executive director here at Learning Alliance. So I manage our seven different departments um, internally. And uh, overall, Learning Alliance is a trade school focused on the telecommunications industry. We train anywhere between sixty to eighty 
uh, field service technicians and a number of different jobs like a tower technician or wireless technician or fiber technician. And um, ultimately, our goal is to help uh, better the training uh, methodology that our students go through. So I spent a lot of time with Joe, right? Uh, you know, embedding um, AR into our solutions to make sure students have a wide variety of learning experiences from virtual to augmented reality. And, uh, you know, bringing the tactile manifest uh, solution to our students has been something that's been, you know, a project of mine that I really enjoy because we get to see them learn in a different type of environment, a different type of way. And how our instructors are able to utilize that gear is something that's very unique. Um, I, I'm all about it. I really appreciate you guys having me here today to speak about it. And, you know, Joe is one of my closest friends at Tactile. And, you know, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for bringing your expertise. And Fred, if it's okay, we're going to start with you because in, a, mm -hmm. in an important way, you're at the front line of the telecommunications industry, right? You're, you're training the next generation of a field technician. So um, if you can give us a few insights into that, maybe starting by, you know, how long does a training last from the time a person comes into the door and then is ready to go out into the field and be, be employed? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it really depends on the program and what the student wants to get into. Um, we find that our programs run anywhere between two to four weeks long. Um, and it really depends on the skills uh, that they're required to obtain. So somebody's going to be heavily in the climbing side where they're going to be climbing towers and monopoles and things of that nature. It's about a four week long program um, that we embed those skills. There's a lot of repetition, a lot of things that require safety. So we want to make sure that they understand uh, the intricacies of staying safe up tower. And then um, when it comes to some technical stuff, lines and antennas, fiber, um, those programs tend to run about two weeks long. And uh, those are the technical skills um, that a student initially gets as a as a green person. So we find that two weeks uh, works out for those technical specific skills. Yeah, that makes sense. And is is um, manifest and you know the AR solution, is that part of the training from you know day one throughout the program or is it introduced later on? How does how does that fit in? So we have a certain methodology here. Um, each student goes through a series of stations that we consider labs. So as they do their competencies, uh, they have to check in with an instructor and make sure that they complete their specific practical and lab. Um, and we embedded uh, the augmented reality side into certain labs that made sense for the manifest solution. So um, we have it embedded throughout the training um, from day one. You know, they get shown the piece of equipment and then different stations will have that as what they utilize to do the training as opposed to an instructor watching them over their shoulder. They can, they can actually interact with the device um, in that lab itself. Now, and one thing I could jump in to, to add in on that is, you know, the safety aspect of things is, you know, not necessarily at Learning Alliance, but, you know, across the board at all organizations, you know, utilizing augmented reality as a first point within a procedure can, and, and, and hitting someone with a, you know, some kind of safety warning or a safety procedure before they get started to really make sure that that sticks in their heads so no one gets hurt. I mean, that's a great way that we're seeing, you know, organizations today start to utilize, you know, some of these digital instructions in these types of environments because safety is critical at both TCI and My Learning Alliance, and, and you know, the ways we can do that to warn people and make sure that they're safe are unique, but also very repeatable, and it's something that you can force. You know, instead of someone just skimming through a safety protocol. And, and just going through the motions where, you know, they, they may think because they've done it so many times, it's not as important, you know, making them go through that motion every single time, the entire motion and making sure that they're warned and ready to go can be critical in the safety of someone's lives that are climbing towers or doing other types of work. Yeah, Joe, that's a good point. I really um, like how when they go into the work instruction and it shows that this step has to be completed now and you click on it and it's going to give you everything that the person has to do. And before they get to the next thing, they're going through and they're kind of defining the things and it's recording the interactions that are happening and it's making sure that they're staying safe, like you said. 
Um, that's something we've definitely benefited from, uh, especially when an instructor has to have the repetition going with the person and that they don't always have to be showing them it. It can be recorded as a video, embedded inside augmented reality. They can go through that repetition as many times to get those skills that are required. So um, a lot of people learn best when they get to see it and do it themselves and they're touching it and they're getting involved in it. And sometimes an instructor can give them anxiety. So it allows them to kind of learn on their own while an instructor is still present, but they kind of have their focal point on the training itself. So it's, it's a very nice solution. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Brian, how about your perspective on this? Um, and perhaps it's related to safety, perhaps not, but uh, you know, AR in the daily lives of the technicians in uh, your company, do you have a, um, you know, a perspective on you know, how that is being deployed in the field right now? Yeah, it, we're, we're, we're early adopters. We're really trying to, to, um, to, to build upon where we're at. We, we work with um, with uh, tactile on building a couple of um, um, kind of case studies on oh, where we could um, put this into practice. So we're really slowly ramping it into the field as, as it rolls through. Um, you know, that's, that's really the, um, the challenge for us, so to speak, is, is having that technician get into that, that, role of here try this see how this works you know specifically around um you know the the generator side of things when we did that that case study it was you know how to how to move from one step to the next and record it so that we could build that close out it, it definitely has um has has worked out for us that's why we're really we're pushing hard to to implement it across and through and you know i'd say on average we're about you know 10 days to, to what Fred was saying about, about, you know, two weeks on the, on the training cycle. Um, and definitely from a, from a safety perspective, we see it. The benefit is, you know, having that, um, uh, being able to record that from, from, you know, your point of view, as opposed to, you know, having one hand on a phone trying to take pictures. And now you, now you have one hand off the tower. It's definitely a benefit. We, we can, we can definitely see it. That makes perfect sense. I'd like to hear from all three of you kind of building on that. And thank you, Brian. Um, mm -hmm. Let's hear about some of the use cases that you're training towards, Fred or Joe, that you and your experiences working with telecommunications companies that they are putting, implementing AR in the field. Can we uh, go through a couple of examples? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm actually working with Joe now. We have a learning management system that catalogs, you know, this every step of the way for one of our students. And um, we do have them go through closeout package processes. So we're working with them to integrate the solution so that the closeout packages are coming into the LMS as a catalog for what our students are doing closeout package wise. And because it's happening in real time, it kind of takes some of the work out of that. So it's, it's definitely been a really um, intricate solution that helps our um, instructors catalog their close up you know packages in a in a good way yeah i would add on to it is you know technicians generally speaking not just in the telecommunication space don't like doing paperwork per se you know the on the back end you know i don't there's a lot of us not just technicians that don't like doing the paperwork <laughs> the administrative side of, of things and when you can do a closeout package that all the data is collected, when you did the job, who did the job, what the closeout package, what evidence was collected, you force evidence and force steps where all that's getting created while they're going through the actual closeout package. You know, that makes it much easier, not only in telecommunications, but across all industries to have a full audit trail of all the different uh, you know, metrics I just said. And it also makes it easier for the technician to, to do that closeout package. And then also on top of that, the safety. If you're having to take pictures using one hand versus using some kind of head-mounted device, right. you know, the safety and having you know two hands on a tower or two hands wherever they actually need to be, you know, to make sure that they're safe, you know, it, it it's evolving, of course, and there are some barriers there with the headsets and people getting used to those headsets because it's just something new. And it hasn't gone through that full adoption curve yet. 
but you know the future for safety and the future for doing less paperwork is very strong in this area. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, Joe. I, I think you know it's, it's definitely one of the major areas that we see that it has full promise. Where you know we actually were um, brought in from one of our customers to actually trial um, with with tactile manifest, um, and from from there, you know. We, we see multiple applications throughout our business, but certainly we're taking that whole closeout situation kind of to the next level. I have one of one of uh, one of my folks actually um, is a champion for that, working with um, with their closeout vendor to see if there's a way that we can have them and Tactile come together, build that within their you know within the the that um, tool so that we can you know do everything one-stop shop again the efficiencies of it too you know fred had mentioned the um you know the that stepped processing right where you, you can't go to that next step until you complete the the first step or the, the, you can't go to the second step until the first step is complete that's that's a huge benefit because you know you know when, when you're out in the field and you're going back and forth you may it's easy to miss something um with with the manifest and, and having that step processing through it, it forces you to make make sure that that step is complete, and you know um, that's that's a huge efficiency. Um, you know, if you missed missed a photo or took a bad photo in a closeout package, that could send you back to to actually re rig a tower, and, and you know, it costs costs a lot of money to do that. Right, that's a great point. Um... Well, I think it's a natural point to talk about this for a second, and that's the um, ability to connect with remote experts. And there's all sorts of great, and Joe, you can walk us through this better than, than I will, but there's so much, so much important work instruction content delivered through Manifest. But when complex procedures come up, you need that expert um, being able to connect with them through the platform and get that person's insights where you are in the field um, is a real a real important component to the manifest system. So maybe Julie, you can, maybe you can set that up and, and Brian and Fred talk about how that's being put to use in your businesses. Yeah, I guess I could just talk about the change is hard. And I think moving into something different and, and doing something different, especially out in the field where it's not in your types of technology, you know, working inside a digital instruction you know, that's, a, that's something that's new to everyone. And, and so what we're finding is that a lot of customers will start with remote assist or the ability to connect directly with an expert. It's a little bit lighter of a change. You have someone, they're already an expert, they're already used to helping other people. And now all somebody in the field needs to do is actually just dial them up while they're going through a procedure. They can immediately connect face-to-face -face live with someone and that person, that expert, can then walk them through the challenge that they're, that they're dealing with. And, you know, working with some of our other telecommunication, you know, partners from a 5G perspective, you know, the likes of like T-Mobile and Verizon, where they're going to be able to give very strong, you know, connectivity out in the field, where this is something that someone could do anywhere. They could be working out, you know, at a tower that's remote, connect live with someone back, you know, maybe across the country, and they can get you know all that assistance they need in the fashion that they're accustomed to. Instead of having that person on site, now they're just remotely connecting. And then over time, you know, as people get used to this type of technology, they're starting to build out you know these templates. So hopefully they don't have to call for help, right? Hopefully you build out the templates so well that you know they're very easy to follow, step by step procedures. No help is needed, and they don't need to call for that additional you know support. But for right now. You know, like I said, change is hard and, and moving baby steps down this path is what we're seeing a lot of clients do with the remote assist capability. Well, Fred, yeah, I, I, we'll go, sorry, Brian, please. But yeah, we, we definitely see it as a uh, as an opportunity with, with um, you know, currently with the, with a couple of our um, vendors, it, their, their technicians actually have to be on site, which limits, again, efficiencies, right? So... The fact that they could be at even another site and, and remotely seeing what our tech on the top of the tower is actually visualizing, that's huge. Um, I think that um, you know, access to that to that subject matter expert who who may not be 
you know, readily available. And, and again, just having the vision to see what, what, what your, your technician is seeing is, is massive. I just, um, we see a lot of, that's really a second, second area. We see a lot of, of, of benefit too. And Fred, want to ask you, is that part of the training regimen in some of your programs or when does that get introduced if it does at all? So when uh, students are utilizing the gear, we have our instructors watching them through that that process. And I, it's a matter of perspective, really, um, from the person who's doing the training. Um, when you're watching somebody visually and you have a person over here and you're watching them like this, you're seeing a different angle of what the person is seeing. So, but when you're watching them and, and you're watching exactly where their hands are and what they're doing, you catch idiosyncrasies, um, especially when it comes to climbing and climbing safely, right? Oh, you actually, it looked like from this angle, you did your lat safe correctly, but you actually kind of messed up during the process of putting that on and seeing it directly from a visual perspective of what they're doing has been very unique. Um, and it gives our instructors a different viewpoint of that person. So I definitely enjoy some of the things that we see from that because they're able to correct things that we haven't seen um, from some of our students prior. And it gives us that much capability to make sure that their competencies are met. Ah, well, that's excellent. And you know, we kind of jump right into some of the use cases, but Fred, I do want to ask you, is it natural for your students to learn with the AR component, do they find it, uh, are they wired to respond well to that? Or does it take a bit of a learning curve to get them willing to accept it and, and, and learn in that environment? You know what, Ray? I would say 90% of our students come here with an Xbox. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're going to spend 30 days here. They're oh, young, oh. 18 to the 30 range and gaming. And it's just a part of culture now. Um, so no, when we throw this onto these guys, they kind of take to it really quickly. Um, and they find it really, really cool because they're seeing everything in a virtual format and they're used to that. So we also have some virtual reality that they get to mess with and we pull in the virtual assets into the augmented reality environment. So now they're able to interact with the 3D models we've created in our video games and they can actually pull up, you know, okay, this is a cell site cabinet and they can see it. And it's a very unique experience for them where now it's like video games, augmented reality or slamming together and and they really enjoy it they have i don't really see them have much issue picking up how the menus function and how they're using their finger to trace things because they've already they're using a computer a lot they're using a mouse you know they play video games a lot video games can have a lot of instruction to them so it's just another electronic tool that they're picking up uh, very good. Uh, yeah it's a hundred percent i i think that um Definitely, with with the um, the the younger folks that are coming into the business, are, are much more uh, reticent to what's going on. How to how to how to deal with you know even the hand movements and you know all all the uh, the various um, touch points on the screen. You know, um, and that that's really where some of our some of our <laughs> you know legacy folks, I'll say myself included. Um, <laughs> a little, a little less versed with, uh, with the Oculus <laughs> and the halo lens. <laughs> Wait, you know, Brian? I, I would, I would add, uh, you know, one thing that, you know, we find is that, you know, the headsets are not unlike any other application. You just have to figure out how to navigate them. And once you do, there's a comfort, you know, the younger folks have, you know, a comfort level with putting these types of devices on, on their head and working in those types of, you know, environments more than maybe the older generation right now. But, you know, it isn't much different. I mean, you get a new software program, you have to figure out how to navigate that program. And there's an uncomfortability, you know, that comes with that in the beginning and even some frustration that come with that. I mean, I just updated my Windows uh, to Windows 11. Everything's in a different spot now. You know, and I don't know where to go, and it's frustrating, right? And yeah. and it's not unlike that. It's just, you know, now you're looking at things in a 3D, so you're looking at spatial movements instead of 2D movements, which adds another layer of, oh, I don't know what to do. But, you know, what I find actually is that the older generation, once they get past that learning curve, they're actually better in the software because they understand the procedures better. They understand what they're trying to do. They're better at following the instructions. 
So they become more comfortable over time. It's just the front end of that. There's an uncomfortability with, you know, the older generation because they've never worked in that type of environment before. And the younger generations, like Fred mentioned, you know, they're used to, and my kids, you know, they, they're upstairs playing inside a VR headset every once in a while. And so they're just used to it. That makes a lot of sense. It certainly does. Well, I, I want to stay with you, Joe, for another second, because you know another important component of the Manifest platform is that customizable work instruction, right? Where you're able, as your experts at the company are able to create those instructions and make sure it fits to a T what that organization is trying to accomplish. So if you don't mind, you'll walk us through you know, some of the details around that procedure. And Brian, after he's done, I'd love to hear your perspective on how your experts are, are finding the creation of those work instructions and putting it to use. Yeah, what we call it is authoring a template. So right, our, our platform is just a structure. It's just a basic structure, gives you the outline, and positions everything for you and gives you the underlying technology for that structure, but it's essentially a blank slate. And the authoring procedure needs to take place for the different procedures. And you, you start with the desktop, we find that is that it's easier still to type on, on the desktop than it is in a, in a you know, holographic three-dimensional type environment. So the structure is built on the desktop, but then you anchor it to the location where it's permanently going to be located based, you know, inside the headset. And what we're finding is if a procedure takes an hour to do, it'll take you two to three hours to actually author that procedure. And that's typically the process that it goes through, unless you're learning the procedure for the first time. You know, I recently went and authored a couple of procedures I'd never done before. It takes a little bit longer because first you have to learn the procedure and then you have to learn how, and then you have to author the procedure. But if you're an expert and that expert understands the procedure, you know, really they're just there to record everything and they're there to, you know, help put it together in a, an easy to follow format on the back end of things so that then it's repeatable. Once it's created, it's created once. It can be used many times. It can be used simultaneously by different users. So there can be these, you know, templates that are uniform. So everyone's doing the same thing every single time. And there's no, a lot less room for error. I can't say no room for error, but a lot less room for error. Yeah, Brian, yeah, I, please. Go ahead, go ahead Fred. Have something to say. Go ahead, Fred. <laughs> um, we we authored quite a few um, lab stations specifically for our procedures, and it only took us about two days um, of working with Joe's team and, and figuring that out. So it was very efficient on time. And it felt very workflow oriented. So if you're good at understanding workflows and I mean, everything process procedure related is workflow. So it fits in nicely with, if you already have a process embedded in your company, it's gonna flow with the, the creation process. So it was a good experience for us overall. Yeah, on, on, on our side, I think, you know, th that first one, that first one that we we put together was, was probably the, uh, the, the most challenging because we didn't really know what 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 to expect and, and what was fully needed. Uh, and once once we really had that understanding of of what the needs were, what what you know um, what manuals were required, what what plans and specs and everything else that we had to kind of kick into it, um, then you know that that second that second and third and Fred, I think you saw you shaking your head. You probably agree that that second and third one that you came up with, you knew exactly what you needed. The steps you, we we had built through those, um, and and now I think we're we're looking at taking on what I would consider a fairly complex um, closeout process and laying that out with various you know manufacturers, various connectors, you know different different situations, and and you know hopefully coming to a point where we can say, okay, you have this type of installation with this configuration and then select that and then run that, run that through. And I think the, our team is, is fully prepared and thinks that that should be a pretty, a pretty quick uh, turn on uh, with, with Joe's team and putting that together. And one thing I'll add to that as well is that there is an, there's an art to this. Absolutely. Not unlike taking a picture or recording a video. Some people are better at it than others. And 
practice makes perfect. And the more people who do this more often, the better you get at it. There's a learning curve like anything in the front end, but, and, and it really needs to be a dedicated person, someone who works on these types of processes and works in the environment all the time, because you do, you learn little things that make huge difference. And you also learn how to record something or how to, how to film it or how to edit it, right? In a way that's easy to follow for the end user, which again, there's some trial and error there, you know, because it is something new and there is some art there and some people are gonna make better templates than other people until, you know, there's more and more people and this becomes more commonly adopted. Joe, that's a good point. I mean, we, since we're training and we're kind of diagnosing if people know what they're doing, um, something that we did as a company when we were building this was we said, okay, can we embed questions as a quiz element while they're doing work instructions so that we know, oh, did they understand a quiz question that has to do with something that they're learning? So at the same time, they're also branching into different scenarios based off of if they uh, answered those things correctly within the platform and stuff like that. So branch and scenarios were a big um, functional help for us as a training institution. So when we learned all those things and we started messing around with just the base procedure, now we have these full branching things that are happening and it's very fluid for the person. They're learning a bunch of stuff and they're being quizzed on it. And then they're, it's recording everything that's happening at the same time. It's it's really cool. Wow, a real teaching tool. That is um, that is outstanding. We, we are getting a few um, questions from the audience trickling in. Uh, anybody listening, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. But a couple that we should have come up right now that are pertinent. And that is one, you know, Joe, you mentioned that um, Manifest is really the blank slate, right? In terms of creating these customized work instructions. Um, but uh, one of the questions that's come in is, um, does or can tactile play any role in developing those instructional videos and procedures? Is there a, is there a role that the company can play if uh, a company wants them to? Absolutely. I mean, uh, to honestly, at this point, it's a necessary evil and we really you know, want to go out there and help our customers because it is something that's new and help. And we do have some packages, you know, what we would call a quick start type package where we get involved, work with our customers. And we do a lot of the authoring or at least coaching on how to do the authoring. I mean, we can do it both ways where we're doing the authoring or we're just coaching you and giving you best practices on how to do the authoring and, and what we're seeing out there. So yes, of course, we're here to help. We also have partners that are willing to help as well that we can refer people to that are very versed with manifest in the way that you can author different template types. All right, well, thank you. Before we go into a full blown Q and A portion of this, um, I'd like to go through with each one of you, just to give us um, the crystal ball perspective. Take a look at the next 12 months and um, you know, give us your opinion on, this is where, um, the AR environment and AR solutions will be used and adopted in the telecommunications field. Any, you know, any insights that you can provide. So Brian, if you don't mind, can we start with you? Sure. Um, you know, we're, like I said, we're, we're, we're very much uh, intrigued by the technology, the benefits that we think it can, can bring to our business. Um, we're looking to fully integrate this within our closeout package and our closeout um, process, you know, within within the next 12 months is what we, we'd really like to, to see this fully integrated. Um, we're also looking at it from a, um, you know, a perspective of our uh, troubleshooting and, and maintenance teams to record, um, you know, Kind of what the the tasks and what they've run into, kind of almost like a historical record of of any given site um, and the the challenges that they've encountered at that. Um, and you know, we we talked about it a little bit, but you know, having the ability to have um, three or four um, troubleshooting and maintenance texts out on out on sites that can contact one subject matter expert or one integrations and commissioning um, technician um, to, to, again, troubleshoot when you're launching a site. Um, we, uh, we definitely see that as a, uh, as, as a process. And, and, you know, there's, there's another side of our company too, uh, 
Timberline Construction. Um, they're looking at this also in their their business too as a uh, as a as a realm to do walkthroughs on on finalized buildings and and the like. So th there's there's a lot we're looking to do with um, with the tool and 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 actually putting it in place within the next year. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, your, uh, Fred, do you mind if we get your perspective now? Absolutely. Uh, you know, for us, it's really honing in the integration with our learning management system so that we're really cataloging our students' progression. Um, same as Brian, we want really intricate closeout packages and making sure competencies are being met. You know, on our side, it's about the competency. You know, Brian's side, it's about getting the work done so you can get paid. Um, <laughs> and in truth, it's I want to make sure that guys leave here knowing multiple different ways of doing a closeout package so that somebody like Brian gets somebody who's trained by us and they already understand, you know, if I take a picture of a blurry serial number, my company's not going to get paid for six months. And they truly care about those uh, minutia in the industry. So even just using a manifest tablet component where they're able to utilize the tablet version of it, um, doing the closeout packages through the hall lens, everything's about building those good habits on closeout packages for us. Um, and we're also looking at doing a lot of integration to our virtual reality assets that we're building on our video game side, making sure that those are getting pulled into the augmented reality um, components so that as somebody is sitting there on a lab station, they can actually pull up, say, like a fiber splicer, and they can see a whole 3D model of that piece of equipment and they can interact with it in multiple different ways. Um, we really want to blend as much virtual training into the augmented side as possible because they both play a role uh, within uh, the structures of the technology. And then making sure that's available to individuals within our training. So getting it scaled up is a goal of ours to incorporate it in more of our training stations so that we're seeing that closeout package process happen within all of our labs, not just the you know four or five that we currently have right now. Outstanding. And, and, and Joe, how about your perspective? Next 12 months, what do you um, predict is going to be happening in this space? What I'm seeing and what I'll, I think I'll continue to see is more OEM type adoption, meaning the manufacturing folks of these towers, the manufacturing folks of the generators of, of you know, the machinery, they're going to adopt this as part of their workflow, and that all it'll trickle down to the users. Right now, the users are front running everything because they're the ones with the problems. They're the ones that have to onboard, teach, train people quickly and, and hire people and get people excited and retain people. I mean, these are all very important problems that users of this type of technology are dealing with today across many industries, but the OEMs are falling are behind. You know, they really should be the ones pushing a lot of this content down to the users. It should be prepackaged and made for them so that they can easily deploy this to their people that are out in the field. So you're starting to see the, the manufacturers of equipment, manufacturing of different construction companies like start to look at adopting this type of technology as part of their process and authoring these procedures to then be available to the users. So that's one area I see that not only is needed, but is also, you know, I'm already seeing a lot of momentum. I see that continuing over the next 12 months. And the next piece is more technology related. It's just the headsets. There's a whole fleet of new headsets that are gonna be coming out over the next 12 to 15 months from a lot of different providers out there. And the adoption of this type of technology will take off as these Headsets become more durable, smaller, miniaturized, not unlike what happened with cell phones or tablets that go out in the field. In the beginning, they didn't go out in the field because they weren't rugged enough, you know, either a tablet or a, or a phone, and then they become ruggedized, and then they become, you know, just more efficient for the people that are out in the field, and they get miniaturized, right? So all these types of technology things are just happening right now, and they're happening quite quickly. So I could just see a lot of different types of uh, headsets coming out and then the evolution of the existing headsets taking place too. All right, that is very useful. We only have a couple minutes left. So I'd like to go through a few of the audience questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one, I think we should start with you, Brian, is um, in terms of the headsets, and this has come up several times today, 
Um, yep. What do your people like to use? And is it different? Do people prefer one device when they're working on the ground, yet something different when they have to climb a tower? Yeah, so um, you know, we've Fred and I talked about this a little bit. You know, we're um, we're definitely in, in the uh, the realm of uh, you know different tower technicians like different gear. Um, uh, it would be it would be a great thing if we could definitely have have this put into like a Petzl style climbing helmet, um, or if there's some way to to integrate it into the the technician's existing helmet. Um, might even be a better situation. Uh, right now, for the most part, on the ground, um, you know, we still because we're we're at active construction sites. This is a ground-based helmet. It works. It meets the, the criteria. Um, you know, outside of just a you know really missing a chin strap, it's the only thing it really really needs um, for for the tower. Um, and for the most part, it's it's really um, you know they like the hollow lens. And those that are have gotten adapted to it, like like Joe and, and Fred had mentioned that they they like the idea of, of visualizing that that real world situation with the augmented elements to it. Um, and then you know, obviously the subject matter experts back, uh, whether they're on a, a laptop or a tablet, it seems that both of those are pretty uh, you know either way on that side because they they can see. They have that visual from from the perspective of, of the tech. Okay, a good perspective. Now, Fred, I got a couple that are certainly in your wheelhouse. And the first one is a good one. Um, how long after graduating Learning Alliance does it take to find a job? <laughs> oh, uh, generally speaking, um, actually, my uh, my guy just sent me, we have 56% of our current students who have job offers. So before they even graduate, they graduate tomorrow, 56% of them already have jobs. Um, so usually within two weeks after their graduation, we have around a 89 to 91% placement ratio, give or take. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we fall at the moment. Currently, just, just on our side, it's... Um... You know, right now, I think the last stat I heard, Fred, um, was that the shortage is somewhere around 22 to 24,000 um, workers. And, and I think yep. that's really, that's that's specific to tower top and, and, and climbing centric. I've heard numbers as much as 80, 100,000 when you look, you know, subject matter experts from, you know, uh, switch technicians and field operations technicians, more ground-based folks. So, it's it's a it's a business that is definitely resource constrained at this point. Yeah, I was actually just talking with a couple of colleagues this morning, um, just kind of gauging what their biggest hurdles are, and they always go back to human resources, figuring out how to get people. They're they're declining work, right? So the when you have to decline work because you don't have the crews and the people to be able to do it, then you know there's definitely a problem. So. Um, we're only a small fragment of that. I mean, we obviously we do graduate at quite a number of people, but um, other organizations, uh, Warriors for Wireless, all these other integral um, components of what's happening. There's a lot of college adoption. There's a lot, all these different parts coming together and collaborating and making sure our industry is set on pace um, is really showing that we're coming together. And it shows that the companies want to hire these guys. You know, if 56% of my people are have a job before they even leave, um, that says something. So companies cool. are definitely, you know, pulling and, and wanting these guys. Absolutely. Well, I, I one more, and I know we're a little bit over, but I do have one more question. And it's, this one is also for you, Fred, and it is a, a continuing education question. Um, you know, you've made it very crystal clear on how uh, Learning Alliance is training the, you know, the next generation of field technician. But the question is, do you offer classes or instruction for the experienced technician to help them upskill? Um, do you have any any offerings like that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we offer multiple uh, project management-based training components for continued education. Um, we have an AS degree uh, that guys are able to enroll into. Um, overall, you know, if you want to learn leadership skills, communication, 
Uh, we help uh, organizations get apprenticeship programs aligned with their organization, which come with top hand related uh, pathways, foreman related pathways. So we really are embedded in helping people gain that next generation of skill within their career progression, not just from the entry level side, but also if you don't have a foreman, then you don't have a crew. And if you don't have a crew, you can't do the work. So you need to be able to skill that person up, um, definitely on the project management side and um, being able to facilitate and mentor people, being that leader comes with a different kind of skill set. So um, we love seeing the guys who excel at that here on the ground when we train them for the entry level stuff. And we can kind of pinpoint that guy is going to be a foreman in like six months. We guarantee that, you know, so um, as we work with the different organizations for our partners, um, we have a flexibility uh, to allow them to work with our continued education side and progress their careers through that as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Well, gentlemen, we are certainly a few minutes over. So I want to, um, I want to thank everyone for attending our webinar today. I want to thank you three experts. I hope everyone out there learned as much and found it as interesting as I did today. But uh, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. If anybody has um, additional questions that come to mind after the webinar is over, email us at info at tactile.com. If anybody would like to have a copy of um, today's webinar, send us a note, we'll send you a link. And uh, for the people that sent questions that we may not have gotten to today, we'll try to follow up with you individually after we're done today. But again, thank you very much to our experts. Really appreciate your time and your, and your insights. It's been a, a pleasure to speak to all three of you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.